say? Well, it all starts tonight. Very, very special evening and a very special year. I can't think of a better way to start it with, uh, with our speaker this evening. Admiral, I've been looking forward to this for several weeks, if not a few months now. All I've heard from the staff here at the museum is what a delight it's been to work with you and, and your staff. And the one thing that's impressed me uh, in, in meeting with uh, the men that serve underneath you is a tremendous admiration and respect that they have for you and, and uh, the deep affection they feel for your wife. And it's just a delight to meet you both here for the first time tonight and to welcome you here to the museum into the city of Newburyport. Uh, Rear Admiral Richard Ryback, he comes from the comes to the first district after serving as the controller of the Coast Guard at the headquarters in Washington, D.C. He graduated in 1956 from the Coast Guard's Academy, holds a Master of Science degree from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and an MBA from NYU. He was Associate Director for Oceanic Science and Technology at the Coast Guard's Research and Development Center in Groton, Connecticut from 1974 to 78. In 1978, he served as commander of Group Portland in South Portland, Maine. His other operational assignments include tours on uh, the Cutters Storis in Alaska, Taney and Alameda, California, and another Cutter whose name I can't pronounce in New Bedford, Massachusetts. <laughs> in, in 1980, he was transferred to headquarters in Washington, D.C., where his first assignment was Chief of the Personnel Division and then was Deputy of the Office of Chief Personnel. 1983, he was transferred to the 1st District where he assumed the position of Chief of Staff. His personal decorations include a Legion of Merit, two Meritorious Service Medals, and three Coast Guard Commendation Medals. He's a member of the American Society of Military Controllers, the American Boat and Yacht Council, the Marine Technology Society, the U.S. Naval Institute, and is a recipient of the Coast Guard Research and Development Center's Commanding Officer Technical Director Award. He uh, is a native of Niagara Falls, New York, married to the former Susan Snell of Middleport, New York, he has three children, Peter, who lives in Oklahoma City, Jennifer in Westminster, California, and Lucinda, who is currently uh, attending Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. Admiral, welcome, and we really look forward to it. Thank you very much, John. Appreciate the kind introduction, and I certainly uh, I want to thank the Custom House uh, Maritime Museum for inviting me to open this series of lectures commemorating the history of the Coast Guard. It's been an exciting period of time for me and certainly one of extreme pleasure to be able to work with the uh, staff of the museum and to be here this evening to meet so many of you. What a delight. Beginning this August, the Coast Guard will celebrate 200 years of service since Coast Guard uh, was established by Congress. And Alexander Hamilton's approval of the Revenue Cutter Service on August 4th, 1790. You're saying 1790, well this is 89. You're probably wondering why we're starting a year early. Well those were 200 busy years, so we have a lot of celebrating to do, so we're gonna start a year early. <laughs> This is where it all began. The first lighthouse, the first revenue cutter, the earliest life-saving effort right here in Massachusetts. So this is the appropriate place for us to be celebrating the beginning of our bicentennial. From my office window in Boston, I can look out over Boston Harbor and the airport and see Boston light. When I work late in the evening, I sometimes wonder if I shouldn't be home. My wife wonders that on occasion. <laughs> When I see the light flashing out across the water, just as it did for most of the last 273 years, I realize that mine is a very small sacrifice compared to the people who have served in our organization. The first keeper out there was George Worthy Lake. And his family, with George and his family, drowned one day when they were rowing out to the light as they did in all, at a, so many of our offshore lighthouses. They led uh, lonely, isolated lives, but they had to watch the lights constantly throughout the night. And so many of them lost their lives, either in going in for supplies or, or in doing something in conjunction with the keeping 
of that vigil. The early revenue cutters operated on tight budgets. Have we ever heard that before? <laughs> Alexander Hamilton started the service because the nation was bankrupt and he needed more money. He needed to enforce tariff laws so he kept a tight rein on spending. One of the first cutters cost more than Hamilton allowed and the unlucky skipper had to raise the difference in order to get it out of hock. Maybe that's what we ought to be doing today. <laughs> Yet the cutters remained on patrol. They fought smugglers, pirates, foreign enemies in the ocean. Perhaps the most courageous sacrifices were those of the men of the life-saving service who literally risked their lives to save others and so many of them died while they were trying. When I think of the Coast Guard's 200 year history, I don't think of books and I don't think of historic buildings. I feel a tradition of service and one of sacrifice that stretches from the first lighthouse to the seamen that's coming into the service today. Service because their efforts are for the good of mankind and sacrifice because the job has never been very easy. People have told me that lighthouses are perhaps the most altruistic structures ever built by man. Maybe that's why there's so much emotion tied to them. We build them to save lives, to prevent shipwrecks, and to help sailors find their way home. They've become a symbol of New England, a reminder of the many dangers and the rich history of our rocky coast. I may be biased, but I think we have the most picturesque lighthouses here in New England. We can just go down the coast from Portland Headlight, Cape Nettick, and the towers at Thatcher Island. They're all around us. And there's a great effort to retain the beauty and to maintain the, those lighthouses. I live in a lighthouse keeper's quarters. I have a lighthouse next to mine. We polish the brass and we try to keep it in a condition which would make the old light keepers proud. Once a year we open our lighthouse at Hospital Point for visitors and it becomes part of the homecoming days of Beverly. During those days and on many of the weekends, one of the favorite questions that people ask of me is how do you ever get to be assigned duty like this so you can be the keeper at one of these lighthouses. How long does it take you to get an assignment like that? And I look at them with a smile and very gladly say, well, it takes somewhere near 30 to 35 years. <laughs> if you mind your P's and Q's. Well, as you well know, most of our lighthouses are automated at this point. So we have very little need for a light keeper. Actually, there are 10 remaining that will be automated this year. <coughs> but we do have a need to maintain the structures. We need the lights. We need to be careful that the structures don't disintegrate around us. In an age when budgets are tight, and I hate to use that phrase because budgets have always been tight. You know, Economics 101 says if there were a lot of money, the dollar wouldn't be worth very much. So I don't think uh, there's been a lot of money to go around for many years. But the Coast Guard has worked very hard to maintain the lighthouses as well as the adjoining structures. We've leased the property wherever possible and at other times we sell the property with an eye toward finding people who will retain the historicity of, of the property so that the history isn't destroyed. We do have a sense of that history, and we work very hard to ensure that, that we don't lose the character of the lighthouses. We're here to celebrate in Newburyport because the first of the revenue cutters, the Massachusetts, was built here in 1791. The cutter's first skipper was Captain John Foster Williams, a Boston native who I think was a tremendous role model for all of us to follow. In the first year that his cutter was in service, the revenue collected in Boston increased by more than $120,000. Think of that, that's a pretty significant amount of money. During its first winter in service, Williams took the Massachusetts 
to assist two schooners that ran aground in a squall. Later, he helped to test and improve lamp for lighthouses and experimented with ways to turn seawater into drinking water. He was an innovator. He was a great person to have as one of our first skippers. And this is the kind of role model that I think we all look up to and it's one of the traditions that has made the Coast Guard as successful as it is today. The revenue cutters had many jobs, just as the Coast Guard has today. In addition to halting smugglers, the cutters assisted ships in distress and inspected lighthouses. They were also called upon to fight the country's first war, the quasi-war with France, because America had no navy at the time. There's a period of about eight years when the Coast Guard was the only maritime force that we had in being. In the early years of Alaska, the revenue cutters were the only law officers that were available. And you can read about another Coast Guard hero, Captain Mike Healy, in one of Michener's books, the book on Alaska. After the Titanic sank, revenue cutters began the first international ice patrol. And we still do that every year, only this time we do it mostly with aircraft. Side looking, airborne radars, and flares, and all of that kind of gadgetry. Many of the jobs are the same though. So probably the biggest difference between the revenue cutter <coughs> service and the Coast Guard is that we've finally gotten away from sailing ships. Well, almost. We don't want to forget the eagle. If we had a little more water here, we'd like to get the Eagle into Newburyport during one of our celebrations. But I think that might be a little chancy. <laughs> Coast Guard Eagle is probably one of the most familiar symbols of the Coast Guard. It's skippered by Coast Guard officers, manned by personnel, active duty personnel of the Coast Guard, as well as cadets. The Eagle has sailed all over the world. Last year it was a an ambassador of goodwill to Australia. Uh, and the demands on the vessel are great uh, from all over the world. They want us to participate in various celebrations. As a cadet in 1954, I had the privilege of sailing on my first trip on the Eagle. I set sail in New London, Connecticut. For 17 days, we sailed across the ocean and and I can remember being up on the Royal one night and there were the lights of Santander, Spain. What a thrill for a young person. Very exciting. We didn't use the engine once during that time. And ever since, I've always respected the beauty, for, beauty of sail and the opportunities that a sailing vessel gives for training. That's an argument that goes on and on and on. Why do you keep a sailing ship when the modern vessels are power driven. But I'm a firm believer that the opportunities for training and sail are, are immeasurable. I suppose that many of you have been out to Plum Island and know about the life-saving station there. Still, I think it's hard for us to imagine the day-to-day day -day life of those men. We, call the, we can call the storm warriors during the day, they drilled with the lifeboats, the surf boats or the breeches buoy. Practice was essential because in many cases, they wouldn't get a second chance. At sunset, they walked the beach patrols on the lookout for ships that went aground because it only took just a little bit because the ships used to ply coastwise and any change in the current or any change in the weather sent them on the rocks. The greatest danger to ships 100 years ago was weather. They had little navigation equipment. When it snows, a lot of us can't get out of the driveway. But think of those lifesavers back then who hauled their boats down to the beach, launched into the surf in the most severe weather. During the famous blizzard of 1888, Joshua James and his crew worked without food or rest for 24 hours and they saved over 29 people trapped on boats, grounded by the storm. Joshua James rescued more than 600 people during his lifetime. 
What a hero. They buried him in one of those surfboats. They paraded, that was his funeral procession. The Coast Guard still saves lives, more than 5,000 last year. Nothing makes me prouder than to be part of the service and to hear that one of our crews has rescued people aboard a sinking vessel. Now we use helicopters, we use motorboats, but I think we have some feeling for how Joshua James felt. One of the more dramatic rescues that we've experienced recently is the rescue of the survivors of the Lloyd Bermuda. This was not along the coast, but it was out there at sea, well over 200 miles, right on the edge of where a helicopter shouldn't be. The Lloyd, Lloyd Bermuda case is interesting from a number of perspectives. Not the least of which was the fact that three of the 11 crewmen are alive today in spite of the fact that the ship had what you might consider a, a catastrophic failure. It sank in probably five to 10 minutes. We were receiving a radio call from the ship and before he had time to to say very much, he gave his position, he said, I got to leave, the ship is going down. Because of our ability to launch both fixed wing and rotary aircraft, we were able to be on the scene very quickly. Pitch dark, black as can be out there. Imagine a helicopter flying out there 200 miles with limited visibility. Those folks are heroes that do that. Our communications capability allowed us to radio to other vessels in the area, and they came very quickly. We were also able to work with aircraft from other services and to coordinate the whole, the whole rescue mission. If you didn't have that capability, the folks would have been dead. We also have the added capability of a rescue swimmer where the rescue swimmer goes into the water. You think of that rescue swimmer going into the water that night about 12.30, black as can be. There was a little dot of light that was on one of the survivors and that's how we, that's how we saw he was there. And then he got down into the water and he had, the, the person in the water had a death grip on some wood. And he had to, he had to get in there and wrench the person off of that off of that wood and put them in the, in the cage. We still have our heroes of today. Only today we're a little cynical, more cynical. And so it's hard to point to somebody and say, that's a hero today. But we have them. The way we use the ocean has changed dramatically in the last 200 years. The Coast Guard has new missions as a result of those changes. We operate a variety of electronic aids to navigation so ships no longer have to go along the coast. Most of some of you are sailors here, I'm fr probably most of you, so you know you can turn that Loran Sea on, you can crawl right up to the buoy. <coughs> we inspect merchant and passenger ships for safety standards. We also develop guidelines for the design of recreational boats and other marine products. We also enforce fishing regulations to protect natural resources. We have spawning grounds out here, and if uh, fishing vessels are prohibited from being in those spawning grounds. And so we've been seizing fishing vessels in the spawning grounds. It's part of our effort toward preserving the natural resource. It affects a lot of people in a both a positive and a negative way. So we're not always embraced enthusiastically. Pollution is another concern of the Coast Guard. Here on the East Coast, my cutters and stations are working with the Coast Guard's Research and Development Center and other federal and state agencies to track the floating waste that polluted our beaches last year. Everybody, of course, is uh, glued to television and the story on the Exxon Valdez. I think we need to wait to see the whole story unfold before we come to any drastic conclusions. 
I want to assure you that we have regional response plans in place and we exercise regularly with the Canadians, we exercise with our own units, and we think we have a good plan in place. It's hard to explain to someone who isn't familiar with the Coast Guard how we can do so many jobs with so few people. The Coast Guard has only 38,000 active duty personnel. But we have eight separate missions. As a district commander, I'm also the commander of the Maritime Defense Zone, Sector 1. So in wartime, I would be responsible for all the military forces assigned to the coastal defenses from Maine to New, to New Jersey. This district uh, that I'm the district commander of goes from the coast of Maine down to the Toms River in New Jersey. This includes vital ports such as New York and Boston, Portland, Maine, Providence, as well as Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and Groton, Connecticut. We get new jobs, we lose old ones. We, we try and stay flexible, but we try to keep our sights on the traditions that have been the cornerstone of our service as it relates to knowledge of the sea and the maritime tradition. My first assignment many years ago was to participate in Alaska for the resupply of the dew line, the distant early warning uh, ring which uh, went across the Arctic. We don't do that anymore. My second job was to go out on ocean station patrol. We don't do those things anymore. We keep redirecting the missions as the needs of the country uh, change, as other things take on a higher priority. Today, we need only watch CNN to learn about the, some of the major priorities of the service. If you were watching a couple of weeks ago, you would see a Coast Guard cutter. You would have seen a Coast Guard cutter involved in the interdiction of, of Haitian migrants. Uh, if you watched uh, a short while ago, you would have seen the Coast Guard involved in drug enforcement efforts. Over the last couple of weeks, of course, uh, you know the Coast Guard is up in Alaska, and oil pollution is a principal responsibility of the organization. I don't think much of Latin phrases, not too much anyway, but I'll tell you one I believe in, and that's Semper Paratus. That's the tradition of the Coast Guard. If you're at a small boat station or at an air station when the alarm sounds, you'll see the men drop whatever they're doing, get to their their resources, whether it's the boat or an airplane, and scramble to do the job. They're always ready, no matter what time of the day. That's our tradition. It's the heritage given to us by men like John Foster Williams, George Worthy Lake, and Joshua James. I'm proud to be a part of it. I think we are a unique asset of this country. And with your support, and we need your support. Don't take us for granted, because we need it. And with your support, we'll be able to retain those capabilities. I'm excited about the year to come. What a wonderful way to start the bicentennial celebration of the Coast Guard. And I want to thank the museum, the staff, the board of directors, for all of your help. Thank you for asking me to be here. <laughs>